Like any entertainment industry, the publishing industry goes through a lot of trends depending on what proves to be popular. One of those trends that's been happening a lot in the last few years is retellings of Greek myths and legends. Most notably, feminist retellings of Greek myths and legends. I guess it kind of started with the Song of Achilles, and then Madeline Miller brought out Circe as well, and you've got Pat Barker's The Silence of the Girls, The Women of Troy, Natalie Haynes' Thousand Ships, and then she wrote Pandora's Jar as well. There's a lot, and it goes beyond Greek as well. We've got retellings of myths and legends from China, Norse mythology, British history and mythology. It keeps going. And I thought I'd get bored of it, but every single one I read, I seem to like even more than the last. And that is certainly the case with Ariadne. Now I first saw Ariadne on a little table in Waterstones, and I thought, oh, another feminist retelling of a Greek myth slash legend. Okay. But I was intrigued. I am skeptical of them because they just keep happening, and yet I do enjoy them, so I feel like I'm always in two minds about them. And I did eventually pick Ariadne up, and it is so good, isn't it, Snowy? It's so good. Ariadne's fantastic for a surprising reason. Two surprising reasons. First off, Ariadne is the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. All the way through this video, I'm very likely to refer to it as the Minotaur and the Minotaur, King Minos and King Minos. I can never decide. Anyway, Theseus and the Minotaur. The Minotaur is a big half-man, half-bull thing that lives in a labyrinth that was created by the inventor Daedalus, father of Icarus, who burned his wings in the sun and then fell to his death. King Minos had the labyrinth built for the Minotaur, and Theseus comes in and outsmarts the Minotaur. I think he kills it. Ariadne is the daughter of King Minos, and I thought, right, okay, this is going to be the story of Theseus and the Minotaur, told from the perspective of Ariadne. And yeah, that's pretty much how it starts, but it surprised me so much. When the book begins, we get quite a few fun stories that set up the feminist themes of this book. Ariadne tells us, or is told by someone, and therefore we hear it too, stories of women in Greek myths and legends who have been screwed over by men, specifically male gods. And so it goes through a few different examples, one of the most prominent being Medusa, who was punished unjustly by a god for the actions of another god. And so here, Jennifer Saint is establishing that Greek mythology is unkind and unfair to women. Throughout all of these different stories, women are so often punished for the things that men did. They are punished by male or female gods, and it's never fair, and it's never their fault. And that's pretty much what the book ends up kind of being. So there's a lot of fun foreshadowing in there, which is a word I haven't used since I was an English teacher. <laughs> in part one of the book, we learn how the Minotaur came to be, and it is disgusting and horrible. The Minotaur is Ariadne's brother, born of Ariadne's mother, who was a daughter of Helios, god of the sun. The Minotaur is locked in the labyrinth, Daedalus builds the labyrinth around it, and King Minos, after he sacks Athens and conquers it, he says that all he wants every year are seven male and seven female tributes from Athens to be sent over to Crete, where he is king of, and these tributes get thrown into the labyrinth and eaten or killed by the Minotaur. He is obsessed with power, and the image of power, the idea that he looks so powerful, so cunning, everyone is at his whim and his disposal. But then, the next tributes come, and one of these 14 tributes is Theseus, Prince of Athens. And Theseus says, I wouldn't ask my subjects to do anything that I wasn't prepared to do myself, so you can have me as a sacrifice. So when we meet Theseus, he seems exactly how you'd imagine him, this perfect Greek hero, this man obsessed with pride and honour. He's chivalrous, he's kind, he's good, he's strong, he's all the things that a Greek hero should be. But when he meets Ariadne, he starts regaling her with his own stories, and you can see his ego immediately. And the first thing I thought of was Zap Brannigan from Futurama. If you've seen Futurama, you know what I'm talking about. A man who is obsessed with his own stories, with his own legend, with his own ego. That's what Theseus is right from the beginning. But he does live up to that. He goes into the labyrinth, and he uses Ariadne as a way to survive. 
and then part two starts. And I thought part two and three and whatever until the end was going to be the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. It was going to be him in the labyrinth, all told from Ariadne's perspective as she is watching him go through the labyrinth and helping him and relaying information or giving him things or using her wiles to help him survive. But it's not. Very, very early in the book, he just kills the Minotaur, walks out of the labyrinth, grabs Ariadne by the arm and says, let's go, you can come to Athens and you can be my princess. Let's go. And then he abandons her on an island for dead. And that's where the book really begins. I was so surprised by the events early on in this book. The blurb indicates that this is the story of Theseus and the Minotaur in the labyrinth told from Ariadne's perspective, but it's not. I was so surprised by that. And the other thing that surprised me is just how focused this book is on regaling us with a bunch of different Greek myths and legends. We get a lot of heroes and gods and monsters all featuring prominently in this book. The main god that is the focus of this book is Dionysus. I love Dionysus. I especially love him in the game Hades. He is beautiful. And I was so glad to see that in this book, the gods are real. This is not a grounded retelling of a Greek history or legend. This is mythology. The gods are real and Dionysus is in the book. And he's great. He's layered and textured and strange and interesting. Ariadne has a lot of skepticism towards men and the stories that men tell about themselves, which I think is its strongest strength. <laughs> Ariadne looks at all of the stories about men, told by men, that men tell each other of each other. It's about male ego. And Ariadne herself, at the beginning, is a juvenile, naive young girl who must grow and become savvy and become strong on her own terms. As she gets smarter and stronger, she's not doing it in a male, masculine way. She is becoming a strong woman not a strong interpretation of male strength. And I absolutely love that. This book is very self-assuredly feminist. It looks at women's strength as women's strength applies to itself, if that makes sense. And it takes a very skeptical look at male strength and male ego and male narratives. Theseus is a Zap Brannigan character. He is this absurdly comical guy who, yes, is very strong, and yes, is very witty and clever, but he loves that about himself. And as soon as a man soaks up his own ego, all of that stuff doesn't matter anymore because you're so tired of it. And he embodies that so well. I loved it. I love the way Jennifer Saint writes Theseus in this book. Starting in part two, you also get Ariadne's sister's perspective on and off throughout the book, and the two of them are fantastically pitted against each other. They're both really naive, but in slightly different ways, and they both represent different weaknesses. And I thought that that was really cool, because then you get to see them both grow in different ways. They both get stronger, but not in the same way, and not to the same extent. There's a lot of character in this, especially with regards to Ariadne and her sister. The male characters don't really grow. They actually, if anything, deteriorate. And the women, instead, are using their minds and their instincts to survive and thrive and fight back against the challenges that come that way. Also, as I said, the amount of mythology and legend that is on display here is great. You get told so many stories. Daedalus, built the labyrinth, and so Daedalus is in the book. Daedalus and his son, Icarus, feature prominently in this book. They, in the background, while everything is going on, are building wings for themselves, and you see the culmination of that. Icarus is never a character in the book, but Daedalus is, and you get tiny little snippets of things that he's done. If you've ever read or watched any adaptation of Greek mythology, you might have come across some of the things that Daedalus is said to have done, and you pretty much get all of them here. You also get other legends and other heroes who are mentioned, including Heracles. Heracles and Achilles are perhaps the most famous heroes of Greek mythology, and both of them feature, at least in a small way, in this book, either in a, a passing mention, a story gets told from someone to someone, but actually Heracles comes up again and again. You get his labors, the labors are retold. And again, you get a lot of different gods being talked about here, but Dionysus is the focus. 
So if you love Greek mythology and you're interested in one specific story, you'll get that here. But if you want a few snippets of other little legends and myths and stories being retold, you also get that here. Ariadne covers a lot of ground. It finds a way to seamlessly inject itself with other little narratives. It's clear that Jennifer Saint has an adoration for Greek mythology. She studied classics at university, and that has continued to burn all the way through her life because she couldn't resist putting in certain gods and stories and legends here, and it works to tremendous effect. I had so much fun reading Ariadne. This whole trend of feminist retellings of Greek myths and legends, it almost feels like it has culminated with Ariadne. There's a real love for Greek myth and legend here. There's the kind of feminist characterization that I really love to see in Ariadne and her sister, and the way that it pokes fun at the fragility of male ego is fantastic. It is one of my favorite topics of conversation. I am obsessed with the fragility of male ego, and it is on full display here, especially in the character of Theseus, and to a smaller extent as the book goes on, the character of Dionysus as well. And I love to see it. I really do. I feel like Jennifer Saint, like many of the writers who've done similar things with Greek mythology, she is writing wrongs. And that is so cool. Writing wrongs while also paying homage to a kind of storytelling and a canon that she clearly loves, has a lot of knowledge about and a lot of heart for. I loved Ariadne. It's really, really fun. It is probably now my favourite of all of these Greek mythology retellings. I can't wait to read it again. It's brilliant. Subscribe for books.